Well, in this game, we're going to have a look at some uh, strategy. And uh, we're going to have a look at a game that I played um, uh, in 2013, and that was against the Women's Grandmaster, Beng. Um, yeah, it was a game I actually enjoyed uh, an awful lot. It was uh, just uh, an interesting position where you had a, a period uh, in the middle where we're just uh, manoeuvring, putting our piece, trying to put our piece on good squares, trying to determine a good structure. And uh, it just turned out very nicely uh, for me. And, um, uh, but there were a number of interesting points for it, so that's why I'd like to, uh, to show it to you. This was the position after, the, after Black's 14th move. And Black had just played a knight back from e5 to d7, attacking this knight on c5. Whereas knight on c5, of course, is um, quite a nice strong piece. A bit hard to say um, what it's actually concretely attacking. Um, but obviously, if you can put a piece that far up the board um, without it being challenged, then that's, uh, then that's always, um, well, it's always going to be doing something annoying. Um, I suppose in this case, we'd, uh, we'd claim that the knight's attacking b7, a6, just stopping this bishop from getting developed. So, knight d7, what does white actually want to do here? Um, well, let's just take a, a look at the position as a whole, first of all. Um, White, how, how, how does it feel? I, I just thought that White had a, had a, a little edge here, I guess. Um, he's got, um, well, a, quite a, a nice bishop, you know, just on, uh, on, on this diagonal. He's got um, a few weak dark squares to, uh, to look at. Yeah, you know, d6, b6, c7, a5, c5, where that uh, white knight is at the moment. All just, um, just, uh, just, just quite nice squares. Nothing concrete at the moment, but you start to sort of imagine that uh, the pieces could sort of uh, nestle on those squares at some stage. Um, nice free development for uh, for White, of course. Um, you know, we can put his pieces on uh, on pretty good squares, pretty much anywhere. You know, some nice uh, ideas here, or the bishop could come here. You know, you could even have a c4, whatever. That's quite nice as well. And one important point: um, you've got a nice little target. And that target is the pawn on b5. So you've got a, a, direct, a, a direct point where you can put pressure on black's position. And um, I had the feeling that, uh, that this would be uh, slightly annoying for black. Because black has to decide what he's going to do with this pawn. Does he want to take on a4 and leave himself with a weak a pawn? Maybe support it? Or is he going to be leaving himself um, with a, um, an isolated pawn on the queen's side? So that's just a, a difficult decision for black to take. And also, I think if we're looking at the, um, at the black position, um, black's just a little, got a little bit less, less space, really. The pieces, uh, you know, this knight d7, knight on e7, um, are um, um, well, a little bit far back. Of course, this bishop on c7 is a bit of a strange piece. Um, not really doing a great deal on this diagonal. And it's not really clear you know, how, where it's going to really be a, a, an awful lot of influence. Uh, I don't know, maybe come to a5 to attack c3. It's a pretty weird diagonal, really, for the bishop. So basically, you know, happy. Nothing uh, amazing uh, happening in the position at the moment. It's not like we're uh, attacking the king or anything, but, um, but just pleasant uh, position for white. Just looking at the position in general, you know, black's a little bit more cramped, less space and all that. I didn't really feel I should be exchanging off those, uh, those knights. So I just brought my knight back to, um, to e4. And I thought that this was actually a, a crucial decision for, um, um, for Black, and I don't think that Black really sensed it uh, properly, because she played uh, her next moves pretty quickly, um, and I think they were actually the wrong, it was the wrong, the wrong decision, I think, the wrong, uh, the, the wrong uh, path. It's all about what is Black going to do with, um, with these pawns. Black knows that White's going to challenge them with a4, I think the, the, the key question is, you know, on which square of it is it going to be the easiest for black to defend? Is it going to be easier if you play a sequence like a4, a6, a takes b5, a takes b5? Is that pawn going to be easiest to defend on b5? Or would it be better if you played a sequence like um, uh, a4, b takes a4, and then, for example, a5? Um, you could also think of a sequence like playing a5 to meet a4 with b4. It's a, it's a, very, interesting, uh, a very interesting moment and just very important for black to really get to grips with it. Um, I decided, I really thought that, um, um, that the pawn on b5 would be extremely weak, extremely uh, easy to attack. 
Um, I also thought that it didn't do anything at all to uh, inhibit white's activity. I felt that um, if black was going to have to accept an, an isolated pawn on the queen side, he should either try and play it with a5, a4, b4, could uh, offer that, um, or he should just play um, a move like a5, a4, and then b takes a4, and leave his pawn in a5. And in that case, I didn't think that, um, I thought that black was, you know, on the way to, to starting to, uh, to stabilize his position. Um, I mean, the drawback with, um, with both these lines, you know, a5, uh, b4, or a5, b takes a4, is that um, white does, of course, get his, um, uh, his center. I mean, he could play something like c4, for example. Um, but I think, you know, black's pieces are, are, are decently active, and I think, you know, if he's, he plays his bishop to b7, and he, he works out how to start challenging uh, the center, you know, maybe at some stage with bishop takes e4 and knight c5, or playing this move e5, or somehow working out how to um, you know, get a knight to e5, or even to, to d4. I'm sure that, you know, that, that black can start, um, if black's careful, that he can start um, um, stabilizing position a bit, but it remains, you know, pretty unclear. In the game, however, what happened, uh, black went uh, bishop b7, and after I went a4, black went a6. Uh, a takes b5, a takes b5. And if we just, we're just going to compare the two positions just to try and understand properly how this is, because it's, uh, it's something quite subtle in actual fact, but it had a huge effect, huge impact on the, uh, on the result of the game. First of all, was that pawn on b5 doing positively? It's um, uh, stopping white from playing c3 to c4. And I think that's the reason why uh, black chose it, just to try and keep um, white's um, uh, center at bay. However, on the negative side, um, first of all, um, it's open to attack. How is it open to attack? It's open to attack with rook b1, and something not very obvious, I suppose, knight to d4. And that's extremely tricky to defend against. How does black defend against uh, two attacks on this pawn? Um, well, you've got to bear in mind as well that this knight, you know, you, you could think that maybe the queen should be defending in some way, but then this knight on d7's got to go. If that knight on d7 goes, it's no longer covering the c5 square, so this knight will be able to, uh, to take the c5 square. Maybe not fatal, but, but not very pleasant. What you could do, I suppose, is think about putting the bishop on a6 um, when white attacks the pawn with, um, uh, with uh, knight d4 and rook b1, but that's not a move you really want to play. I mean, the bishop's on an, on an open file, so if white puts anything on there, it's always going to be attacked. And I mean, it's just completely passive. I mean, that bishop's just uh, on a6, it's blocked behind the b5 pawn. I mean, that's just um, that's a horrible positional move. I mean, if this knight on d7 never moves and the knight comes to the c5, then this bishop on a6 is just uh, is in, is in big trouble, basically. It's not something for the long term. I mean, when white goes rook b1 and knight d4, you might be able to go bishop c6, but that's looking tactically very, very dodgy. You know, something with knight takes c6, and then this knight moving along maybe here or here. You know, I might even start getting my, my, yeah, my king side attack, you know, with queen h5 as well. So that's really, that's a very awkward decision. You know, just this, this rook b1, knight d4, very simple means. How is, um, um, is black going to defend his b5 pawn? Um, and there's something else to the position as well um, that was true in the other cases, but here, you know, coupled with this, with the awkwardness that black faces, you know, trying to, um, uh, to defend the pawn on b5, it's simply that white can play his bishop to a3, you know, and uh, cut across the, um, the, uh, uh, the black position. And that makes, you know, any moves of the knight on e7, uh, you know, much more problematical. You've got, you know, extra stuff with knight d6 now as well. It's, uh, it's very, very awkward. It really is. I mean, during the game, I didn't see, um, um, I didn't see a real way for black to, uh, to get any sort of, um, of, uh, of equality. And, you know, after the game, I didn't, I didn't either. And, um, well, the computer's very positive about this too. There's one further uh, thing that, um, that you have to spot with white. Um, but, um, but once you've spotted it, it makes just everything completely clear. And that's this idea for black of going bishop takes e4. 
Because it looks as if you, you, you might just say, well, look, um, at least with bishop takes e4, I'm defending this, uh, this b-pawn in, uh, in one go. I'm removing this piece that's um, threatening to come into d6 and to c5. Okay, I'm giving up the two bishops, but I'm fine. I can cope, you know. I can defend the pawn on b5. That's going to be all right. But there's a very unpleasant, uh, unpleasant idea here for, uh, against bishop takes e4. And that's when, when black goes bishop takes e4, I'm going to play d takes e4. Now, what's the point of that? If you uh, spot this, then, uh, then well done. The point of this is that I'm opening up this diagonal. This gives me two possibilities. I can play my bishop to f1 to increase the pressure on b5. I can also play my queen to e2 as well to increase the pressure on b5. So actually this move bishop takes e4, it doesn't solve anything. It makes the problem even worse. I can put even more firepower on the pawn on b5. And actually that just means that it's just going to get lost. I mean, that's the, um, that's the upshot of it. And essentially, you know, what, what, what we're saying is that after this move a6, we're saying that's actually a huge positional blunder because that pawn on b5 can no longer be held. Um, so we're essentially saying that it's losing the game, you know, at, at a sort of, uh, sort of a high level, basically. Um, and that was what made me so interested about the game. It was, uh, you know, just a small decision like that, that, you know, it's very hard to really, um, especially this game was played on the, on the Sunday morning, you know, after three games on the Saturday. So you're not, you're not at your sharpest at that, uh, at that moment. It's very hard to see that a small decision like that is going to have such a big effect. And um, it just shows how, you know, how sharp you have to be on, the, on pawn structure. So what happened? Um, well, quite an interesting uh, follow, follow up there. A4, A6, A, B, A, B. I played my bishop to A3, first of all. Um, just a good square. No need to hurry with rook B1. And um, black took on E4 straight away. And now I... Uh, Played my d takes e4 and felt very pleased with myself. So what did black do? Rook e8 to be able to move this knight, get out of the pin, and rook b1. I mean, it's those those sort of um, and these sort of situations are very nice. I mean, it's really you know hands back, you know, just very easy moves here. You know, just um, rook b1, knight d4, bishop f1. You know, it's it's just incredibly easy. And Black's the one who's you know, having to struggle like crazy, thinking, you know, can I hold it this way? How can, I, how can I do this? Of course, because Black's pieces are so far back here as well, you know, knight d7, bishop c7, it's very hard for, for Black to create uh, counterplay quickly. So um, what did Black do? Black did, well, you know, very reasonable. Just try to get uh, the pieces active here. So knight c6. Dealing, of course, with knight d4, but now I'm coming with bishop f1. And Black decided to give up the pawn for counterplay. Knight d5, knight e5, knight e5, and then bishop takes b5. And then Black went queen f6. So quite a sneaky tactical move, actually. Um, and uh, I, I don't know, I wish somehow I had, sometimes I had that iron discipline that I just say, no, tactics are not, uh, not important, we're not going to look at them. Of course, what happens to me is that... Um, in a, in a flash, I just see um, one interesting thing, you know, that might make this possible. And then uh, I just can't resist actually just uh, going along and working out the whole thing. Not bad when you've got lots of time and I had masses here. But, um, but also, also not, uh, not, not too sensible when, uh, when, um, when you've got a bit less time, a bit, uh, a bit less time on the clock. The point was, what did I see? Um, I saw very quickly, I could go bishop takes e8 here, knight f3 check. King h1, um, and then rook d8, because obviously this is, uh, um, this is really very important. If, if black goes uh, knight e1 straight away, then I'm just winning very, very easily. Rook takes b8, queen f2, thank goodness queen f3 isn't uh, dangerous. And then I just bring my bishop back, check, takes, and queen d8 mate. Uh, that's pretty good, but so Black's got this rook d8 intermediate move. Um, but what I can simply do is go queen e2, and after knight e1, I can go bishop takes f7. So I was thinking here that um, oh, this could just be a, a very nice, easy way of, of picking up two pawns. But suddenly I um, I noticed that Black could just go king takes f7, and um, rook e1, queen f2. 
queen c3, rook c1, queen a3 is actually rather annoying. Rook c7, king g8. Um, I didn't have, I didn't see a way I was going to give checkmate there, which um, well, really should be uh, should be the idea, I suppose. Um, and um, uh, the other thing is that if I go um, queen takes e1, which was what I was thinking of doing originally, protecting this pawn on c3, then that goes queen f3 check, king g1, and now I wasn't very happy with bishop b6. Um, I'm two pawns up, um, but obviously I don't particularly want to play rook b6, rook d1. Um, and otherwise, well, black's just going to come along with h5 to h4 to, well, maybe h3, or maybe even just h takes g3. And um, it's not very easy for, for me to get, uh, to get free. I mean, maybe it's possible, but I, I, was, um, I was sort of thinking, um, well, if I manage to get myself free at the cost of a pawn, then, you know, that's, well, I'm just a pawn up, but I've just had a lot of trouble, basically. It just didn't seem worth it, but obviously now I just kept on trying to find, uh, see whether there was just one little extra way of uh, doing things. Um, well, so it was, it was one of those positions where it's a bit of a shame because you know, you know that um, um, when I play a move like King G2, which was I played in the end, black goes G5, um, uh, sorry, black goes um, uh, Rook D8 first, Queen E2, and then uh, G5. And then, um, well, black's managed to stabilize uh, herself a little bit. So you're going to have to make yeah that effort again to um, uh, to win the position, or to you know, to start pushing black back. Whereas um, uh, if you can just take that that rook on the eight straight away, get two pawns, and, uh, and 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 just get a winning position, then you know that's much easier, of course. But just didn't seem to be uh, to be in there, or you know you need to be a, maybe a supercomputer to analyze that and, uh, and get away with it. So just um, a question of playing a good sensible moves, and I was quite pleased with what I did actually. Um, Black plays g5, threatening uh, g4. So I just played the quiet move for uh, h3. Um, yeah, I mean, black might decide that, uh, that she can play h5, you know, to, uh, to try and get in g4 anyway. But it's a pawn sack and black has to calculate it. And, um, uh, well, black's got very little time and I've got masses. So it's just a very nice little move to play like this, h3, put the pressure back on the opponent. So black went bishop b6, another very natural move. Attacking f2 and trying to keep the queen um, uh, tied down. So again, um, very similar little move. Rook f1, just defending f2. Again, putting the pressure on black. What are you going to do? So um, black again, yeah, short of time, not easy. Decided to play um, h6, just a, a holding move. G5 pawn is protected, and trying to say to white, right, well, what do you want to do? And I spent um, a couple of minutes here. You know, I was, I was thinking, well, what can I do, actually? Um, all my pieces look good, but I'm, um, I'm, I don't want to do anything, uh, you know, enormous or um, incredibly dynamic at the moment because, you know, any move that I play is, is just weakening myself. Is there a way to, to just increase my position just a little bit, just to, um, uh, to expand a little bit, just to get a little bit forward? And I was just uh, taking a little tour of my pieces, you know, uh, one by one. I look at my pawn on uh, my bishop on c3, my rook on b1, my rook on f1. Everything looked good. And then I looked at that bishop on b5. And uh, I thought, yeah, it's not really doing that much, is it really? Um, and actually, that bishop on b6 is quite happy. You know, it's, it's sort of shielded behind that, um, that, uh, that bishop on b5. But what I could do here is play this move, bishop a6, which uh, gave me a warm glow inside, I have to say. And um, what does it do? It doesn't do very much. It just covers the, um, the c8 square. So black can't put any pressure with the rook on the pawn on c3. And it just attacks that rook on b6 now. So um, it just means that in lots of lines before where black was maybe looking to sacrifice something or get something, do something active. And uh, he never had any problems with this uh, bishop on b6. Now black's got to think about the fact that I can always play rook takes b6 at some stage. Nothing huge, nothing amazing, just, um, uh, just, uh, just annoying, and uh, especially in time trouble. I mean, I've learned from, uh, from playing, uh, from playing uh, Michael Adams in, uh, in these things. Michael was always doing things like that to me when I was short of time. Um, and, uh, and it was very, 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 very irritating. And actually, here it paid immediate fruits because, you know, Black didn't really know what to do there. A little bit worried about things. Played knight d7, which is a, a very big mistake because I played bishop d6 now. 
in this case, uh, you know, Black had virtually no time and, uh, and resigned, in actual fact, immediately. Because after rook e8, I play e5, broken the blockade, and I'm going to just... Uh, I'm actually just going to come back probably with, um, with bishop b5 and then just uh, you know, go for bishop b7 and, uh, and just get this knight and all these pieces are just going to be hanging. Black could have carried on, but I mean, it really, it's really is now really bad, you know, so it's uh, a decent decision to, uh, to resign to. So that was that game. A um, couple of interesting things. Um, and I think it was just that, just really being aware of what pawn stretch can do for you, because that decision on the 16th move you know, playing after a4, playing a6 or not, or playing b takes a4. That was, to be honest, the moment that decided the game as far as I was uh, concerned, because after that I just went to a clear advantage, which you sort of think should be convertible, you know, if, um, uh, as long as you play it well. Um, and, yeah, that's, that's it's subtle, you know, it's not something that you just that screams out at you from, uh, from, from, uh, from nowhere. Um, so that was very interesting. And just the end of the game as well. These little moves, you know, h3, rook f1, and then bishop a6. A very nice way of uh, converting your advantage. Really just keeping on trying to expand your position, just move it forward a little bit, and just put the pressure back on, uh, on the opponent. Um, I thought that was very nice. And, uh, well, certainly bishop a6 gave me a nice warm, uh, warm glow inside. So, hope you, uh, you enjoyed that too. Hi, this is Grandmaster Damien Lemos. First of all, I hope you enjoyed um, this video. If you would like to receive more free chess videos from us, you can just click the subscribe button below. I would also highly recommend signing up for my free mail course, The 10 Grandmaster Secrets to Dominate Chess. During this exclusive course from onlinechesslessons.net, I'll share with you my own Grandmaster shortcuts to effective attacking, defending and growth hacks to improving your chess without uh, complicated books or memorization. So sign up by clicking the sidebar on the right and I know you won't be disappointed. Once more this is Damien uh, for OnlineChessLessons.net and I'll see you uh, in my videos. Thank you.